So uh, it's a great pleasure for me to to introduce uh, Bruce Elmagreen. Uh, I've known Bruce essentially for my entire uh, professional career, and even when I was uh, a grad student. Uh, I don't know if you if you remember this as vividly as I do, Bruce. But uh, for, to me, one of the turning points in, in my education was when we went to the first Crete meeting. Uh, and you, John Scalo, myself, and another yeah. grad student from Spain, walked to took yeah. that trip through the Samaria Gorge in yeah, in, yeah. in Crete. I remember and you, very well. And and you and Bru uh, and John kept discussing the entire trip. And me yeah. and my friend were just listening to your conversation and being enlightened enlightened by by all the things you were telling each other you know and to me that was like oh i'm witnessing yeah this master's discussion <laughs> or like witnessing a, a master's chess game or something so for me bruce has been an inspiration my, my entire life and it's a pleasure to have him here well, bruce got his phd from princeton and then he worked uh, for some time in harvard and then has been now for several decades at IBM, uh, IBM Research, Research Center. Uh, but Bruce is an expert, uh, especially on star formation in galaxies, both local and, and uh, more distant. And it's a real pleasure to have you here to, with us today, Bruce. So please go ahead. Thank you. Um, to finish that story, from my point of view, I, I remember, of course, the Crete walk. What I remember mostly is, is John tutoring me on turbulence and persuading <laughs> me Mm -hmm. that no it's not just clouds you have to think of turbulence and everything was turbulent and so on and mm -hmm. it took whatever 18 kilometers for him to persuade me <laughs> and then I, I was so beat up at the end you know i was all into the turbulence thing that really <laughs> did change me around and of course i i worked on and and later we did the uh, annual reviews together so i have great respect for him and i i was the student on, on that walk too i felt so <laughs> so it was, it was good to have the company of you other two to learn from John. He, of course, was early in this, um, quite the master. At, yeah. at the for just, I would just like to add, for those younger people in, in the audience that don't know, John Scalo was my, my thesis yeah. advisor in, yeah. in grad school. But that trip was, the, to, I think it was just like a cruise through Nirvana's knowledge <laughs> of Nirvana or something like that. Very good. So please, Bruce. OK, so now let's find this thing. See if I can share, which I did a minute ago. I think I'm sharing. Am I sharing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now I have this thing down here. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so um, my, my good friend, Yuri Evermoff, some of you will remember, he passed away early last year. Um, and I have been communicating over the years. We were always interested in this problem of what density waves do, how they might interact with gas, how they might trigger star formation. And he was always pushing me to look at images and more and more. And, and it, it got to be almost a nuisance. I couldn't see what to do with it. So finally, I got into the Spitzer archive and look at some of the eight micron images. And I found something t totally remarkable to me, which I in retrospect, hadn't been seen, even though these are archival pictures that have been on the web for quite a long time. And this is not what Yuri was after, not what I was after, but um, it, it's what I want to talk about today. Um, so you know the story, uh, spiral galaxies uh, str are strung out like pearls along the arms, according to Vada in the 60s. And of course, the early 60s, it was uh, photographic and, uh, and mostly they saw um, uh, blue sensitive features. So, but, but when you hear that expression, pearls along the arms, you think of a pearl necklace where the pearls are regularly spaced. And it's not evident at all in most spiral galaxies that there's a regular spacing. Debbie and I have looked for this for quite a while. We've written some papers about it, but usually it's, it's just a mess. And so you see these different kinds of spiral arms. You see the grand design on the right often connected with bars and almost always connected with uh, collisions, if not bars, rarely totally isolated. You see the multiple arm, which is quite typical on the lower left. You see the flocculent type in the middle and, and all of them have star formation. And because the arms are so different, maybe the star formation is all different. 
what's really happening. Um, so let's start with this. 100. You look at this and you say, well, wow, there's star formation in the spiral arms. Um, it looks like you go along the legendary track set out by Lin Shu and Roberts that you have the shock, which is the dust lane, and then downstream is the star formation. So there's your clock all laid out in front of you as the gas and stars flow through. But you can't really tell what's happening exactly. You kind of see it too late by the time you see the H2 regions and the young stars. And also, this doesn't make a lot of sense because if you compare the star formation contrast, arm and inner arm, to the gas contrast, they're almost one to one. It doesn't look like the gas is doing anything different. It's just more compressed than the arm. So is there triggering or not? Or is it just re rearranging the gas and the star formation brought along with it? Well, these are old, old questions. The answers are that some galaxies, you really see a sequence where Clouds go from um, non-virilized to virilized in the arms. You see um, other kinds of age sequences very clearly in some galaxies you don't. But in all cases, you don't see the smoking gun. What's really happening? So here's a typical archival image. Um, I'm getting these little notes that someone is entering and I'm supposed to admit so maybe I'll admit to get that note to go away. Here's oh, an no, uh, You don't have to worry about that. Okay, I'll let yeah. it go. And, and look at this, you see the arms, but look carefully at the arms themselves and you see all those little red dots. And here's a, let me uh, advance, we have to do it. Okay, so here's an unsharp mask image. This is the eight micron divided by 24 micron. The 24 micron image is three times bigger approximately. So if I divide the two, it's like taking an unsharp mask. And, and then the cases where you see blackness around a dot, that's just because it's quite bright. It's bright in 25 microns. So I've subtracted a little bit bigger piece. But generally you see these dots all along the arms. These are the eight micron cores and they're brought out in an unsharp mask image because you, you flatten the background and you also remove um, the, the bright emission the, uh, from pHs and so on that's locally diffuse. So this is what was the startling image of, to us in our first paper a couple of years ago. And you don't see these optically. Here's a head-to-head -head comparison. These are uh, really nice ground-based optical images. Um, like here, there's th three in a row and another two here. You, to the same scale, you can see these two arms. In this case, you could see the three, but here not. Look along here, the nice, in the upper right, there's some nice regularity, but, but not here. Several cases um, where you see regularity, like in the top middle, where there's hardly anything because it's too faint in the optical. That's true for the top left. Um, in the main, here's a main northern arm. It's f five or six beads. These are quite regular, and you don't see any of that optically. So this has been hidden. So we've defined in this galaxy M100, 27 filaments, 147 clumps. Here's some of the statistics. Um, this uh, sort of neighbor, near neighbor separation in units of pixels, just to show that it's resolved, that corresponds to 410 parsec peak, or the separation um, divided by the sum. So this is like the relative separation. Um, and the fact that their peaks around zero mean they're equally spaced along that row with another peak around uh, at, at a gap point. So the, the, these numbers confirm your visual impression that not only are there these little dots, but they're also somewhat regular. And also the ratio of the clump separation to the diameter peaks at around three. So these properties, regularity and spacing, three to one kind of spacing, is consistent with their formation by gravitational instabilities in these filaments, which are the dust lanes, that are fairly close to the critical line density. Moreover, the simultaneous appearance of all these clumps along long filaments, many, many KPC along the arms, suggests that the filaments are uniform in age. Otherwise, if a filament uh, you know, collapsed and moved on and another one formed, that part would be uniform, but maybe if it, were, uh, if it took a little longer 
or start a little earlier at another place, you wouldn't see the regularity. But when they're regular, they're all sort of simultaneous. So these dust lanes are building up, looks like they're building up somewhat uniformly for a period of time and then, and then collapsing and then the new one builds up. And the model here is just that you have, um, I wanna get rid of that, there we go. Um, you've got the density wave and shocks forming the filaments, which are the dust lanes, a gravitational instability to collapse in star formation. Okay, so our next paper, we looked at essentially everything in Spitzer where we could see a good face on eight micron image. Um, and so we picked these 15. And you could see the dots in these images too, but it's better to um, blow them up a bit to use unsharp masking here. For example, 628, if you look carefully, you see that, but there is some confusion. And, and here, now on the left is the first way we did it, this uncharred mask, the eight micron divided by 24 micron. But then we realized, well, it's better just to do the usual uncharred mask, just to blur the same image. So it's the eight micron divided by the blurred version of itself on the right. And it uh, makes it much smoother. Uh, you don't have all these black halos around it. Because after all, the 24 micron is a different source than the eight micron. So it's better to to a blur it with itself. And that's a true unsharp mask. So now you see all those little dots. So here it is. This is 628. And every little filament or shell or feature that's longer than it is thin has dots in it. Here's another one, 3184. Again. 3351. Again. But eight micron, uh, at the, uh, the, the tiniest features are quite bright and they're well separated. They're, they're very real little objects um, and they're always occurring in these filaments. So that's kind of a the usual story these days. You see local filaments, you know, uh, torus and filaments and you see, um, oh, the, whatever they call them, the snake or the, you know, this nesty or whatever, there, there are lots of filaments. And we know there's star formation along them, but this is on the, the mega scale. There's another one, 4254. Okay, now the apparent magnitude distributions for these, apparent magnitudes are all about the same. This is our observational selection. The, uh, this shows histograms of the apparent magnitude distribution for all of them. The cyan color, typically on the left of these histograms, are, are tossed out in future analysis. The blue ones we like, in those cases, they're always brighter than 16 apparent magnitude, but also they are detected in all the four IRAC bands. And also they're non-stellar, which means a 5.8 minus 8.0 is greater than 0.6. So those are the good ones. Uh, the others are included here also. And the red are the cores that are in the spiral arms, 5194 and 1566 are strong um, two-arm spirals. And you can see the cores in the arms are a little brighter than the cores everywhere else. So that makes sense. Um, 7793, a flock in the galaxy that has cores just like the others. And then at the, uh, the high end, you can see the typical um, power law for uh, interstellar or star forming features. And of course, the turnover is from a sensitivity limit. So isn't it remarkable that I showed you those pictures of the galaxies and uh, you know, it was really the same if I showed you all 15 of them. They all kind of look the same. But why should that be? Because they're at very different distances and there's a, an important selection effects which makes them all look the same. So first of all, the selection effect is that the angular sizes of these galaxies in the Spitzer archives are all about the same. They're therefore um, sayings or other surveys where they like to pick a certain size so they can resolve what's going on. So that's the selection. And given that, now look at this correlation inside the data. The mean separation between the cores that's along the arms scales directly with the size of the galaxy. So bigger KPC physical sizes of galaxies have their cores separated by a larger amount. But these larger galaxies are more distant because they're all angular size. So we're not seeing the smaller cores. So there's probably cores all the way down, but because of the selection effect, we just tend to see the bigger ones and those to end up somewhat regularly spaced. And the self-similarity works out exactly because of the quirk of the luminosity function. For most star-forming regions, the number of a certain size 
or luminosity, not size, if luminosity goes as L to minus two, approximately, same for mass. So the total number of cores exceeding a minimum luminosity is the maximum luminosity divided by the real minimum value. That just comes by integrating this equation. So the total number exceeding an observed minimum luminosity comes the same way. It's this maximum luminosity divided by the observed minimum. So if we have fixed core properties, the same everywhere, the same real minimum luminosity, the same real density, then the number, total number, and the maximum will scale with the galaxy size. That's the size of sample effect. So when all galaxies in the sample have about the same angular size, the area and the, the maximum luminosity scale with distance squared. Also for fixed limiting apparent magnitude, the minimum observed luminosity scales with distance squared too. So the number observed larger than some observational threshold goes as distance squared over distance squared, which is constant. So they all end up looking about the same. It showed colors, 3.6 minus 4.5 versus 5.8 minus 8.0. They're all about the same colors. We've excluded the stars here. I already told you there was a limit taken out for that. But the centroids of these colors correspond, particularly sensitive in the 3.6 minus 4.5 is extinction of photospheric emission, and particularly sensitive at longer wavelength is PAH emission. So these are most likely, uh, I've not found any other color-color uh, um, tracks which can explain these. Most likely, these are highly extincted young star-forming region. You're seeing primarily a highly extincted young photospheric emission. Also, you can take that IRAC luminosity and consider um, a young stellar population. So that gives you the bolometric luminosity two then factors of a couple, and then convert the bolometric luminosity to a mass for young age from say population models. So that gives you the sum to mass of the cores, the easy way, not totally accurate, but that's all we have. Um, and here's a plot of the star formation rate in the whole galaxy versus the sum mass of the cores. And the ratio is the age. And if the core age is in that range, then we've accounted for all of the star formation rate in that galaxy. So the cores last for on the order of a million years, now accounting for the missing ones, which seems like a reasonable time scale. We've seamed and summed up all of the star formation rate. So you can do the same with H2 regions. You can do the same with other measures of star formation rate. The FUV tells you the average star formation rate on 100 million year time. It's H2 regions, 10 million year time. Well, the, and you get the same answer, aside from extinction, corrections, things like that. Well, the earlier time ought to give you about the same rate if, if this is, if it's not, the whole galaxy isn't oscillating in rate like crazy, which they aren't because they're big systems. And so um, it's reasonable we have found the youngest um, version of these um, things that we have been used to seeing in later stages, namely the H2 regions and general FUV emission from dispersed OV association. What about the Milky Way? Well, we've known for a long time that um, there are spiral arms in the Milky Way, and this was really the discovery in 1954, and even the naming of those arms. Um, 54, you'll recognize, is just a couple years after they got the telescopes to observe H1, and immediately they mapped what they could see. And soon after that, even the next year, I think they mapped the Southern Hemisphere and got um, the Carina arm that was done in Australia. So oh, H1 is a good place to study. So here's an H1 map of the outer Milky Way from more modern times, from Ku uh, 2017. And you see it's very clumpy. Clump size is typically a KPC, but there's a smoothing length here of a half KPC, so you're not going to see much smaller. Clump separations maybe a one to two KPCs. And here's the same kind of plot for CO. That's the inner part of the galaxy. CO tends to show you gas structures there. H1 is better in the outer part of the galaxy. So it's, it's clumpy, and you see the spiral arms. So in detail, let's look at some of those clumps. Here's one, W345. It's that H1 feature here in this Perseus arm, and you'll recognize these uh, regions of star formation. And then you see 7538, another one that, right next to it. You'll recognize that. 
And if we look at the TO survey of the outer galaxy of velocities, there, there are those two. So these are two big concentrations in the Perseus arm. They're right next to each other. They're separated by six, seven, eight hundred parsecs, not the 410 of the main arms for M100. But these are big clumps in the spiral arm. So we can see it when we really have a good profile of an, an arm viewed broadside, the Perseus arm, we can see that the major concentrations of star formation are not all just everywhere dribbled along. They are concentrations with a separation of several hundred parsecs. Looking in the south, NGC 3603, now we can use, this is at a positive velocity. So uh, in this case, we are um, far outside the solar circle, far away in the fourth quadrant. And you can see all the H1 distribution from Grabelsky. And you can see all the CO that was known at the 1987 time. That's essentially from the uh, Dame Thaddeus survey. And first of all, the CO is highly clumped inside the H1, point I've been making for a long time. It's not random. There you see these big H1 features, which are, are more than just shielding layers. These are somewhat virilized. And, and what we think of as an enormously bright region of star formation, NGC 3603, is just this little tiny CO cloud, and there are others next to it. But here you see this beating along the um, Akrina arm with a separation of about 0.6 kpc, just a little bit bigger than M100. And here we go, the near part of the fourth quadrant. These are the negative velocities. So these are inside the solar circle, two big H1 clouds and their concentrations of CO, Eta Carina, another enormous region of star formation. If you just look at OB associations, you think it's a whopper, but it's just this little CO cloud here in the midst of a concentration of CO clouds in the midst of a H1 cloud and the masses of these H1 clouds are around 10 to the seventh. We've known that for all these years, uh, but again, there's a regularity to that separation. So what's happening? So a quick question, Bruce, yeah, yeah. are these uh, H1 clouds what used to be called super clouds? Uh, yeah, sometime? I call them that, sure. Yeah, okay, it's a, okay. It's so a title these, that... Mm -hmm. These yeah, are like kiloparsec scale the H1 clouds. Yeah, I mean, their sizes are maybe four or 500 parsecs, typical separations of kiloparsec or so. And they're seen in other galaxies as well. Yeah. So what's happening? So as you know, I've been looking at this a long time. And the idea that a shock front would be unstable, goes back even further, even longer before I was looking at this. But the idea that the shock fronts in galaxies would be unstable, it, there's literally a twist to that problem because it comes in and it's shear. So there's a lot of shear inside that shock front and it only has a limited time. It flows out quickly. So can it become unstable and make a, a glob before it's forced to flow out again? And this, was just a hypothesis at that time. And it took a long time to do numerical simulations of that. Um, and it turned out to be true. So this really begins, Kim and Ostrager is Kim's thesis. So this goes back to the first ability to do um, sort of flow in a box, shearing flow in a box, um, not a whole galaxy, following with time as, as the uh, wrapping boundary conditions would bring features in again, again, this, the shocks would strengthen, and eventually, after two orbits in this case, they would go unstable. Um, the Dobbs did this later, comparing with gravity and without. And you still form lots of little structures without gravity because what comes into the arm is clumpy. It so there's an, a root then a root number kind of clumpiness even in the arms. But what gravity does is it gives you a regularity to that clumpiness because it pulls them together. And you can also see, I don't know if you could see this, but in that top right, you can also see a lot of these clumps are forming feathers or spurs right in the dense region. Not so much here because gravity is holding it together. And as it tries to come out of the arm, it still has its feet in the arm. So it sort of unwraps with a reverse shear and gives you a kind of of filamentary um, structure. Here's an even more detailed high resolution simulation. You see this beating, there are probably two types. There's a type which looks like a Kelvin Helmholtz instability and, 
various authors have studied this, sometimes wiggle instabilities, various kinds. Um, but there's also the type that develops over time, looking just like uh, a gravity is the actor. Because they all have little cores in them and they're regularly spaced, they don't have this kind of structure. Okay, so what can we get from this? Um, we can go back to uh, Bonnell and Dobbs 2013, where they have a nice little um, diagram showing the time development of flow through a spiral arm. And what I want to take from this, there's a lot of details they talk about. It's a really nice study. But what I, what I want to get from this is a basic time scale. How long is the gas likely to stay inside a dust lane? Now, we know how long it's in an arm because the arm to arm time is whatever, that's just the pattern speed. You can get that. Maybe it's 200 million years or something at mid radius. But it spends much more time in the arm than just, than just the geometric width of the arm compared to the arm to arm distance. Because the density is higher in the arm, so the flow through velocity is much slower in inverse proportion, just the continuity equation. So it may, if the arm in arm contrast is 10 to 1 or something, then it may spend 80% of all that time in the arms. So we know it's in the arms for a long time, but we, we don't really know how long it's in the shock front. So that's what I'm interested in. How much time do I have to play with to see if the gas can be there long enough to gravitationally collapse? So this is a good simulation which sort of answers that. And I see this time sequence going from here and they track through individual gas particles in these four frames. So th this is the total time to go through an arm. And it's something like 30 million years or a little bit less in the arm. Of course, if Stronger shock might be less, and it depends on the uh, relative pattern speed, so it depends on the radius in the galaxy and so on. But let's just work with 30 million years. Okay, so now we have a lot of information. The clumps are filament instabilities. Then the separation is the fastest growing mode, which is for a critical filament, which, which is, this defines the criticality of a filament. That's the velocity dispersion, that's the mass unit length. The fastest growing mode has this separation, which we measure. So now I have the ratio of the line density to the space density. But I also have the growth time, which is a limit. So that gives me a limit on the density, which can be combined with that previous ratio to give me a limit on the line density, which can be looked at in terms of the critical filament to give me a limit on the velocity dispersion. And the line density times the separation now gives me a mass for the gas clumps, I can compare that to the stellar masses, a couple times 10 to the three, I get my 1% star formation efficiency. So that's interesting. But we can get more. We know about the layer thickness, they're all about 100 parsecs, factors of two or so. So with the mass per unit length and the thickness, now I get a transverse thickness, which I can barely resolve. It's gonna be about 80 parsecs from these two numbers to give the mass per unit length, because just the product mass per unit length well, times the mass and so on gives you that. And we know a pixel is about 60 parsecs, typical, depending on the distance. So they're just barely resolved. Also, they're extremely smooth. They're not really wiggly. You've known this for years, even optical images. These dust lanes, you don't see this at eight mic microns because I got 60 parsec resolution, the pixels are bigger. But optically, you can see uh, 10 parsec resolution or less. They're very, very smooth. So whatever's coming into that shock front has a very short mean free path. So the pre-shock ISM is either many tiny clouds or a warm, smooth, neutral medium. Considering a typical Mach number for a shock uh, to either of these media coming in, Mach numbers maybe three or so, that's a pressure jump of 10. So either you've got a two-phase ISM with a cloud filling factor increasing from its usual 10% to 100%, so that's cloud agglomeration giving some smoothness, and then collapse happens or you've got a warm neutral media coming in with its density jump from pressure and then it cools rapidly. Uh, so now, uh, because of this factor of 30 or so, so now you've got uh, this very low density warm neutral medium coming to a rather high density cool neutral medium. In both cases, you end up with a rather smooth cool neutral medium and the mean free path has to be short. That's true also for uh, lots of diffuse clouds. They have a pretty short mean free path. So either you've got a little collisions of lots of diffuse things. You've got a phase transition induced by this pressure jump and then star formation follows. 
Okay, so let's take another few minutes uh, uh, and talk about edge on galaxies. And maybe before I do this, I'll ask if there are any questions. Seems like not. <laughs> well, there'll be time at the end too. Uh -huh. Okay, so in the Spitzer archive, um, there are three, we looked at it, some dozen, over a dozen, many uh, don't have good resolution, many don't have many clumps, um, so, some are just ambiguous, um, but these are three good ones. Good because they all have lots of clumps, several hundred clumps in them, it's, it's the usual thing we were seeing for face on. So we thought, okay, so what's the perpendicular thickness? of star formation as seen from these clumps. What are some other properties? Can we see spiral arms and things like that? So here are three cases. This is again the eight over eight um, unsharp mask. And you can see these dots everywhere. There are lots of them, several hundred. And on the right, the way we would find these, we would, um, De Debbie would sort of put her little cursor on it and get the coordinate and send it to me. And I would make a, 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 a figure showing little dots, blue dots where they should be. And then we'd superimpose them. I'd use Photoshop to superimpose them and I'd see the missing ones because you know, you don't get them all. So we'd iterate a few times until all the blue dots covered all the little eight micron dots. And then we were pretty sure we got them all. Some are stars, like you may see this, they're known to be stars for other reasons. So you see they're all over the place. Many, many dots. Here's, here it is now comparing, the, so this takes the same galaxy, cuts it in half, it takes the southern part and you tips it over sideways, put the southern part up here, it goes from the edge to the center, and down here continues the center to the northern edge. I do this so we can blow it up a bit. Here's the optical and you really don't see them. Here's the eight micron unsharp mask. These are all, all little dots. And these circles, are at the same positions. Now they're circles rather than blue dots so that you can see inside them so you can see whether there's an optical feature there. Because these circles are at the positions of the eight micron cores and they're overlaid on top of the optical feature and you can see most of them do not have eight micron cores in them. Some of them do, that one does, some of these up here do, most of them don't. And in the other part, same story. So again, these are invisible. Of course, for an edge on galaxy, that's no surprise. You don't expect to see much. They're invisible for face on behind some 10 magnitudes. They're even more invisible for edge on, but we can see them at eight microns. So we would not have a clue where the spiral arms are, what's going on with star formation, what the thickness of the star forming layer is, or any of that. Certainly not from H2 regions, which are heavily extincted, certainly not FUV but maybe we can get a clue from eight microns. So here's the last, the, the, the second galaxy here's at the top is the uh, eight micron unsharp mask. And with its little dots, you see that nice eight micron nuclear region. Um, and here it is optical. In this case, I do it a little different to make another point. This is the optical image. This is an interacting galaxy. As you see, it's really messy up here. It uh, flares, it's got a warp. You see all of this uh, diff diffuse starlight here because it's a mess. But look at that eight micron disk. This is to scale now, and I can align these with surrounding stars because I see the stars at eight microns also. And that eight micron disk, aside from the fact that it's full of clumps, is really, really straight. And it flares up here, and I'll talk about that in a second. But it doesn't warp so much. Even though the galaxy looks heavily warped, it must be that that warp from the interaction is in the outer part. We're seeing mostly the inner part here. And also it tells you that disks are very stable, which, which had been known. It's hard to bend a disk because gravity of the disk pulls things back. If you try to bend it, it'll make little waves, vertical waves, which oscillate around and mix up, uh, eventually uh, damping with some kind of phase mixing and it makes a little thicker disk because it heats it, but it ends up with the same, approximate same alignment. Disks are very stable. So here's a galaxy seriously whacked, but that main star forming disk stays pretty much aligned, although it flares a bit in the other parts. And the last galaxy, I see 5052, its dots and its optical image. And these two um, sources are just remarkable. 
they look blue in the optical image and they're real headlights at eight microns. These are real sources um, they have normal colors and so on. They're, they're blue even in the, at, um, at the first two uh, IRAC bands, but they're very bright. They happen to be centered. I don't know if that's some message to us or what it is. Totally luck in my opinion. Here they are. These red ones are stars, which I use for aligning. Okay, so here are the apparent magnitude at the top, the absolute magnitude at the bottom. They all have about the same apparent magnitude distribution like before, but 5052 um, is uh, closer, so I can see a uh, fainter absolute magnitude. And again, you see the characteristic turnover just from uh, completeness limits. But what I'm interested in is in the perpendicular distance from the midplane. So here they are for 891, that thin little razor thin galaxy that's so well studied. Uh, it's, the distribution is quite close to the midplane, 100 some of parsecs. 3628 is that interacting galaxy and that goes all over the place. It gets quite thick. The, the half uh, size is 300 some parsecs. And 5052, again, it's, uh, a little over 100 parsecs, and, and I'll give you a possible reason for that, but it's still quite thin. So to detect that a little further, here's the distance from the midplane versus the radius. So 891, all of these dots are the individual cores as a function of radius from the center. And here's the height, and the midplane is defined by the average position of the cores. You can see it has a little bit of a thickening with radius, not much, a factor of two or three. 5052 actually gets a little thinner with radius and that's kind of a clue. It's not perpendicular, it's not exactly edge on. You realize if it's tilted, then the, the central part's gonna be thicker than the edge. You know, you imagine a, an old long plane record, it's edge on and you tip it to the side, it's gonna bow up in the middle. So that's kind of a signature, but at least it's not strongly flaring. In both cases, I think you conclude that the thickness is about constant or perhaps a factor of two or three a flare in the main disk. Of course, they flare a lot in the outer parts. And 3628 has a real big thickness. It's really all over the place. And what I've done here on the right is show as a function of distance. So the left-hand part here is the highly flared western side. Um, and on the right-hand side here is the hardly flared eastern side. So you can see 3628 where it's not severely damaged by the collision, it's a pretty much flat thickness. Um, just like these other two, the other side um, is showing you some flaring. And if I go back to these, you can see that. Here's all that broadening in the flared region and not so much here, maybe that other guy is but you see you can see the red dots here if you look very carefully you can see some red dots here okay okay so just to remind you the milky way is kind of like this that the co has a more or less flat thickness inside the solar circle and then it starts to flare if you drew a single line um, you would say it flares a little bit over most of the star forming region factor of two or so but it's mostly flat. Now, this may seem obvious to you. You've heard about this for a long time. The, the Milky Way, you know, the CO disk is not flaring that much, but it's actually a remarkable thing. And I remember when I was a youngin, so this would be in the early 80s, I think, Debbie and I visited Van der Kort's office and he showed us these edge-on pictures. He was looking at edge-on optical images. That's where he invented his truncation. You know, he was worried about all that. We know now that disks don't truncate. They may have a second exponential. They go, no one's ever seen an edge. But he was saying, look at their absolutely constant thickness. Why should galaxies have a constant thickness? And you know, young and me, I didn't know. And it's still a very difficult problem because the surface density of a disk is exponential. So somehow the velocity dispersion of stars, and now we learn gas, is decreasing exponentially as well with twice the scale length, so that the dispersion squared over the surface density is constant. So that means um, whatever is scattering the stars 
is probably coming from the disk itself. So it can control this. Similarly for the gas. Okay, so maybe the gas is scattered by star formation and everything's decreasing exponentially and it all works out. Maybe the stars, I've written several papers on, on this, including a recent astro pH. Maybe the stars are scattered by clouds. Old Spitzer Schwarzschild. That makes sense. That gives you all the right scale height and velocity dispersion versus time. And our point is that if you look at the lateral scattering of the same thing by clouds, you automatically get an exponential radial profile. But that's an example how something in the disk can do the action, which then controls the thickness. And that's the only way I can think of where you could get this more or less constant thickness with radius. And then of course the flare in the outer part, because the gas reaches a minimum velocity dispersion, it can't get any cooler than say the, the warm neutral H1, which is mostly what's out there, eight kilometers per second or something. And the disk keeps going down exponentially. So now you do see that denominator of the thickness, sigma squared over sigma, little sigma squared over big sigma, denominator goes down exponentially, the numerator is constant, so now you see the flare. Okay, so now the magic continues because now if we have a pretty constant thickness, and it can vary by factors of a couple, but we have an exponential surface density of everything, then the space density, the midplane density is directly proportional within these factors of two to the surface density. And now all you need to explain the 20 year, 30 year old Kennecott Schmidt power law for total gas is just the Q regulation, which is happening anyway. No one, I think, would be upset by that in an exponential disk where H is somewhat constant. So the space density scales with the surface density. And you put all that in, you got your exponential disk, Q constant, so that tells you how the velocity dispersion is varying. And by the way, the implication here is that the velocity dispersion is gravity driven, it's Q constant driven. And I understand that there's feedback. I think it happens to work mostly on the GMC scale. And what we're talking about here is the thickness scale. So there's your equation for thickness. And aside from pi's and g's, there's your um, uh, density. And the star formation rate is just the available amount of material that's there, that's sigma gas times this. Um, the rate and the gravity rate is square root of density. So if you plug all that in with a typical rotation curve from flat to rising, you get these star formation surface densities and they all have a slope of about one and a half. And it's essentially the same as what you would have guessed, the star formation rate surface density is the gas times the epicyclic rate. And the, the reason that works out is just that, um, H is about constant. This is not the Kennecott Schmidt law or the Leroy Bigel law for molecules, where you get a unity slope for a different reason. I think that's selection effect of a certain density for molecules. Okay, let's look at one more thing. Let's really zoom in. Let's look for shingles. Shingles have, this is an old topic, it goes back to the Milky Way. We look at star formation tracers in, say, the Sagittarius arm or other places. And they're not totally aligned. They often show these shingles. Sometimes the shingles are regular, like real shingles on your roof. Some people call them corrugations. Maybe they think there's a wave. So is that happening here? And you can clearly see there's stuff, there's coherent structure perpendicular to the plane. Maybe this is a shell with its little clumps in it. Maybe these are correlation or corrugations or something. Oh, this is the central part. So again, we're going from, um, the north through the center to the south. Here's a little something edge on. Uh, so what are these? Um, 3628, similarly, look at this little chevron structure. These, by the way, I've looked at the spacing here and deep projected it given the inclination and the spacing is about 400 parsecs. So this could be a spiral arm seen in a not totally edge on disc. And here's another and here's another. And here you see the flaring even in the outer part here and a worse flaring on the other side. But even the flares, you toss stuff up there and it's still gonna clump up into these eight micron cores. Whether this is a feedback shell 
or just a, a, a an oscillation shell from a perpendicular excitation I don't know 50 52 not much you see a lot of uh, perpendicular structure here looks a little more random and these are those two big headlights okay so this is essentially the end of the talk I'll just conclude about these edge on galaxies um, for these edge-on cases, hundreds of eight micron cores, and here are the numbers, 173, 267, and 60 for these three galaxies respectively. Um, if you imagine that they would look about like the face-on ones, if we were to see them face-on, we can pretty much guess what the core extinctions are, you know, eight and a half, 8.8 8 .8 in that case, um, which gives you a reasonable mass column density for a GMC type region. But then we have more extinction for these edge on ones, so we can get the foreground extinction to them. It's another 11 magnitudes or something, which is not unreasonable. It corresponds to an average midplane density of about unity. So it's, it's, it's pretty reasonable, but it, it underscores why we haven't been able to see the star formation optically in these galaxies. The average young stellar mass in these regions is about 10 to the four, depending on distance. And again, the ratio of the core mass to the star formation rate, that is the summed core mass for each galaxy is one to two million years. So this is the lifetime and it's pretty reasonable. We can also get another number comes out of this. Um, we cannot resolve these because the eight micron beam size is too big. That's not, I said even before is on the order of 80 parsecs, typically it's 800 parsecs. But we can, uh, given the luminosity and, and so on and other things, we can guess what the, um, intrinsic sizes and it's about 10 15 parsecs unresolved so one to two million years is pretty reasonable for a star forming region before it really blooms and sends out the h2 region and other stuff that that leaves it and makes it much bigger under parsec scale so if this is the lifetime then these cores represent the earliest stage of most star formation in these galaxies and that's not just dust lanes anymore it's really everywhere as you've seen because most things end up filamentary, that's your first stage of gravity, and then the filaments go into clumps, which is your second stage. Or maybe the shock, shock itself or the shell is your first stage to make the filament. Half thicknesses are pretty reasonable. Um, 3628 um, has the flare. There are high loops also suggesting super shells and blowouts. And most of these, as in the face-on galaxies, have no optical tracers. And then the face-on, if you look carefully at Spitzer images, you do see many of these as little red dots in Spitzer images. If you look extra carefully at opticals, you see maybe 20 or 30% of them either as very red features or maybe there's a breakout H2 region nearby. So, but you never would have guessed other there and certainly would not have seen the regularity and certainly could not have made conclusions like this about total star formation rates and so on um, just from the optical observations. So there you have it. Let me stop sharing and we could have some questions thank you thank you very much Bruce. uh can we see some raised hands for questions yeah okay enrique go ahead oh okay uh -huh. well yeah I, I have a number of questions of course uh but I'll, I'll ask just a couple and then let other people uh ask them one of them just uh, from the early part of your talk so if I, if I understood correctly, you're saying that each one of these uh, eight micron clumps or a course is essentially in a filament. Is, is that a, a true statement? They are, yes, but um, they're not all the filaments are the classical dust lanes. Some are more irregular, exactly. some are spurs and so on. And, and in like 75, 7793, which is a small galaxy flocculent, no, there's just stuff everywhere and the fill the the cores still have peripheral stuff around them they're never they've never like drifted away from something they're never really isolated they're always part of a, a more elongated structure so so you would say that uh when you when you look when you use this technique basically you're seeing filaments in in the not so prominent spar alarm features of the galaxies is that correct so like the filaments are scattered more or less everywhere on the on the on the galaxy disk is, is that more or less well true? no that for for classical um spiral arm galaxies multiple mm -hmm. arm or grand design mm -hmm. there are many filaments even optically you got the main arm you got the spurs there's mm -hmm. shells which you can say piecewise filament 
that's where the cores are here too. And you don't suddenly get a whole bunch of extra filaments any more than what you would have seen optically as dusty kinds of features. In retrospect, seeing the 8 micron, you could see that, oh, here there really is a dust feature, but the H2 region makes it so blurred, I didn't realize it was filament, but I can see it really is there. Yeah. In, the, in the edge on cases, it's different. You don't have a clue. In the flocculent cases, though, um, often, often you would not have connected the dots so well optically because the H2 regions are intermixed. You, you would have said that maybe they're just sheared little OB associations, which is still very likely. Um, but uh, there the, the filamentary nature stands out and, and often there are networks uh, uh, that look like they're hitting each other at the ends. Maybe some are closed networks, which are too big for super shells. You could call them interarm, interflocculent arm regions and so on, if you like. But there it is more irregular. There you would see these as filaments kindly. Your eye would, for the first time, wow, it's all filaments. That would be for a flocculent galaxy. But for grand design, you've known about these all along. Nothing. Yeah, and the other question is, I was a little bit uh, confused by by your statement. I, I mean, I like I, I liked, of course, you, you you know that I would have liked the statement that the velocity dispersion is essentially gravity driven. Uh, so, uh, um, in order to keep a Q that is more or less constant, but by that but that uh, collides a little bit in, uh, with my understanding that the velocity dispersion in the arm in the gas does not vary that much and in fact that, that uh, this is an argument this is interesting because i've heard the argument that the velocity dispersion doesn't change that much from the stellar part of the disk to the just gaseous part of the disk more outwards um, so that in, in one sense that's evidence that the velocity dispersion is not so much driven by stellar feedback but on the other hand doesn't go quite well with the idea that it sort of somehow scales with the uh, with the surface density, so there I'm a little bit confused. How, how how much does the velocity dispersion vary with radius, for example? Yeah. So now I'm sure we agree. Well, I'm not talking about the dispersion inside GMCs. Uh huh. I'm talking about the GMC to GMC dispersion. That's giving the thickness. Okay. 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 So in the Milky Way, we do not see this because mm. it's the wrong direction. In other galaxies, we see it a little, but we barely resolve the GMCs, so we just get a, a velocity dispersion of, of CO. And I deliberately did this study with Christine Wilson a couple of years ago. She had some ULERG information. She was re-reducing re it all. She had star formation rates from radio continuum. And we did find the velocity increased with radius mm -hmm. in, in those cases. And, and we got a, a kind of catch relation, other things like that. It's a hard measurement. In the case of um, uh, other galaxies, or if all you have, if you if you assume that the th the z dispersion in the Milky Way is the same as the two d dispersion, mm -hmm. not crazy. Mm -hmm. um, it's even hard to get the two d dispersion because you don't really all you see is a velocity. You don't really know its distance exactly. You don't know what part of a stream flow it's in, a spiral density wave. You don't know really what the rotation curve should give you. So, and, and as you saw for W345 and 7538, they're sort of next to each other like this, but they're at different distances, and which means they're in different parts of the spiral density wave flow. So getting a dispersion, a, a cloud to cloud dispersion, which you would need to get the thickness is tricky. And, and uh, I, I cannot account for the fact, citing dispersion observations, for why the Milky Way CO thickness should be constant out to the sun. Mm -hmm. Quite right. Tough problem to observe it. Mm -hmm. Hard problem in other galaxies, too. Mm -hmm. So um, you have a very good point. OK. OK. So By the maybe, way, maybe. You, you asked about filaments. I should mm -hmm. say, these are, these are all colliding flows. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, right. anytime you see one of these, it's like something's yeah. gliding and making that. And I, you know, I talked about the diffuse. Yeah. So it's there just what you're saying. But but because these are so big, it's really 2D colliding flow, mm -hmm. and not the 3D. Mm -hmm. But it's still the same principle. Right. Okay. Thank you. I I'll let somebody else ask questions. <laughs> uh, Rosa has a question. Rosa, hi. 
Rosa, you're mute. Sorry, thank you for, thank you for the nice talk. Um, the, the regularity of these things, of these bits is really striking. So maybe after all, it was true what we have been saying for a long time that the gradients are there. They're just confused by the dust, by the H2 regions. Yes, yeah, exactly right. But this is very, very ordered. Yeah. Runs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very ordered. There, there clearly is this triggering process. There clearly is the gradient. It's what you've been saying all along. What, yes. what threw us off is all the extinction and irregularity of what we do see. Plus, it is still true that the excess efficiency is not noticeable, or sometimes it is. It's not that big. It is you know, true. They're, they're not two Kennecott Schmidt laws. You don't have one for the spar alarms and one for everything else, you know? There's, it's not that much of a difference. So that was a trick also. I know, I know, but the but the density waves are operating there very yeah. clear. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Rosa, Javier. So yeah, thank you for for being nice uh, talk. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, I'm kind of confused um, whether uh, the precursors of this of this uh, regularly spaced. Uh, collapsing regions here is a of a gravitational origin or of hydrodynamical origin because kind of at some point you say that you have these shocks and then you have a uh, instabilities but but then i'm not sure if if if, if the origin is is uh, gravitational or or hydrodynamical what would you say yeah i'd say if it's long and thin it's probably hydrodynamical but, but maybe you mean a spiral density wave. It's gravity that's driving the hydrodynamics. So it's both, right? Gravity is, is causing the gas to come in and deflect. It's driving the whole flow. So you've got the gas-gas shock. If you didn't have yeah. the density wave, you wouldn't have those long filaments. Yeah, but then what does it make the, the, the equal spaces, the uh, regions? Gravity the, drives- the linear instability? The, the, the instability along the filament, that's what-, what Yeah, I mean, it goes nonlinear quickly, but you get the fastest growing mode coming out. Yeah, that's what I think. So that's gravity. So it's a combination. If it were just a, a sheet with gravity, you would get blobs everywhere. And maybe that's close to a, a flocculin case where you don't have the strong coordination from a density wave. You just have, that's, the standard interpretation in the flag, you get these local instabilities which shear out. Um, in every respect, they look like that. You don't see the gradients in them so much and so on. Um, so then the, the filaments would be a kind of a residual of this collapse in a network. Um, but so in that case, it, it could, well, I mean, gravity could be the origin of it all, except, but gravity is causing the hydro. And the hydro is what's causing the thinness of the filaments because you've got shocking and cooling and everything else. And it's the thinness of the filaments which allows them time to condense because now they're dense, the filaments are dense, to make the clump. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Jane? Um, hi, nice talk, Bruce. Um, hi, I was wondering whether these eight micron features can discriminate between high mass and low mass star forming regions or whether you just can't tell what you've got. Yeah, well, I, yes. I, I showed you some luminosity functions and I showed you a pretty normal power law at the up, upper end. So the most luminous ones would be the massive and the low would be low massive and then I lose them. But I have not looked at, aside from arm versus everywhere else, the arm ones are more massive or more luminous. I have not looked at where the massive ones occur, if they have any special place. So you raise a good point. I should take the histogram of luminosity, the brighter ones and the lesser bright ones in the good sample and make maps of where they are and see if there's any sense to where the massive ones are compared to the low mass ones. That would be a good exercise. But I, I haven't looked at that. Okay, because this might affect any time scale um, conclusions you, you draw. It could, but I'm used to thinking of density for a time scale rather than mass. But, but yes, um, density, and mass are related if you have a given thickness like of a shock front, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. And by the way, there are optically dust lanes where there are no clumps. So I, I guess these are earlier stages of the same thing. 
I've only told you that wherever there are clumps, there are dust lanes, but there are dust lanes without clumps. Probably lower density. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we, we will take one question each from Enrique and Roberto, then we should thank the speaker. So Enrique, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, okay. So you also said uh, something interesting. You, um, you said something like, that, that the gravity, so that even without in the simulations by, I think, uh, Ian Bonnell, I think, yeah. that they did some simulations without gravity and then with gravity. Yeah, and then that was that Dobbs. The, that was pure Dobbs, Dobbs I think. Just Dobbs, okay. Uh, yeah. And that the effect of gravity seemed to be to pull the clumps together. Is, is, did I understand correctly? Well, yeah, they conclude that um, in all cases, the shock is a clump clump collision front because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they have a clumpy medium. And that's the reason that's why I gave the diffuse cloud mm -hmm. analogy. Um, but that, uh, yes, in fact, while this is happening, the gravity uh, can focus them together. And in fact, they would notice, and I didn't mention, but if there is a clump building, then that tends to give you a little focusing also. Right. What comes in next is is more likely, it doesn't have to travel the full distance mm -hmm. from the interfilament to the clump. It's on its way even while it's coming in. Right, yeah, uh, uh, the reason I ask this because that's what we've been are claiming that happens when you, when, especially when you have the phase transition from the warm to the cold gas, that you form like, like a collection of clumps. Yeah. And then it, it is the entire clump collection that begins to contract gravitationally. Yeah. Because many people have pointed out that individual clumps sometimes are not genes unstable. They're, That's right. Uh, they uh -huh. yeah. But it, it is more like the ensemble of clumps yeah. that becomes gravitationally unstable. And so yeah. that's, why, that's why that comment yeah. attracted my attention. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and, the, mm -hmm. and, and this, this threshold for instability, you know, a filament, infant filament, is always unstable regardless of the line length. If it's a low line length, it just has a long separation. What that criteria, the threshold that has to do with the, the other direction. So that's a good, that, that's when things really start to go fast also. Um, but any filament would be unstable. So you can have arbitrarily, un, arbitrarily stable little pieces in it, and it, given enough time, it will come together at, in a fastest growing mode. Unlike the genes 3D, where you really have a threshold, mm -hmm. in lower dimensions, it's always unstable. Uh, okay. you, just have, you just vary the time scale and the length scale. Oh, okay, that, that's a good comment, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, Enrique. So one last question from Roberto. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. I, I was just wondering if if these uh, re regularly spaced uh, compact sources are also seen in surveys at longer wavelengths, uh, far infrared or any of those yeah, few galaxies. We, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we looked, at, but the resolution is not good enough. So um, uh, JWST, what's it called now? The something telescope? Yeah. Um, ought to see these at, yes. at good resolution. But 24 micron, just this factor of three was enough to kill you. And in fact, early studies with Spitzer of eight and 24, studies by Calzetti and you know the usual group, they talked about clumping in spiral arms and they always deconvolved everything to fit the 24 because they liked that 24 micron to give a star formation rate. They knew it, they knew what to do with it. So they lost, they just washed out the structure that was actually in their eight micron data in, in wanting most of all to get the star formation rate, which put them with the 24. So yes, the bigger clumps of clumps can be seen as clumps in 24 micron, but you lose um, the, the content yeah. of my talk, you know, because it just the factor three blends them but, together. And as you saw, the ratio between the separation and the thickness is this factor of three. So if yeah. you lose a factor of three, they go away completely. But I was wondering, even longer wavelengths that are more sensitive to the bulk of the material, um, or also, I think, uh, or, or com also separate technique. Uh, I think also Joao Alves and some people were making like extinction maps uh, of, of full galaxies. I don't know if NGC 300 was on, on them, or, or a millimeter emission map. I think some people is. So yeah, the, the fangs group. I, I think you want to catch like the youngest sor sources, no? So probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah. The Fangs group in their first, I was communicating with uh, some PhD student whose name I forget, first author paper came out a half year ago and we were communicating a year before this. 
uh, finds these exactly, did M100, found the CO analogs of these, gets the same spacing. So these are really CO clouds as well. Um, okay. Because there you get the high resolution, that's ALMA. Yes, it would be great it, it, to do continuum or other things with ALMA, uh, you ought to see these. But, but they're not just, well, yeah, they're hot dust. That, that, should, that should do it. The hot, the, uh, I think we're probably seeing a lot of PAH emission, which is a little more confined. Hot dust mean free path could diffuse a bit. So um, we'll see. But yes, you should be able to see the longer wavelength with an interferometer. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Roberto. Okay, uh, let's all uh, thank the speaker again. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> thank you. Good to see you all again. Be safe. Yeah. Until we too. meet again. <laughs>